season is almost done. We've got about eight or so games left of the season now. So I thought we have time here, or we've seen enough of the season to really judge sides. And I want to look at each club and look at the thing which has really held them back this season, if you like. Whether this be a transfer they made, a transfer they didn't make in the summer, a certain tactic they've been using, a manager they appointed or didn't appoint. We've got a whole range of stuff today. Of course, let me know in the comments below if you agree or disagree with these uh, picks for the clubs. And let's begin. We're going to go in a random order today. Random order. So, we start with Newcastle. Newcastle's biggest mistake this season for me is signing Sandro Denali. Now, this might seem a bit harsh, as technically Newcastle had no idea how this was going to play out. But looking back... I think we can all admit this was a massive mistake. I don't actually have an issue with them um, signing Denali as a player because he's very good and proved it early on at Newcastle in the couple games he had, he looked pretty good. The problem is, of course, the elephant in the room, the betting ban, which has meant he's missed the entire of this season. They spent so much money on him only for him to not be allowed to play, which is so disappointing. And given their FFP issues, if they didn't sign Denali, they could have used that money to reinvest in the squad elsewhere, which is definitely, definitely needed. But I will cut them some slack as there's likely no way they would have known about the looming ban. But still, it's very clearly a massive mistake. Manchester United midfield recruitment. There's been a number of mistakes by Manchester United this season, but the biggest for me is their midfield summer recruitment. If we cast our minds back to the summer, Man United had a midfield of Ericsson, Casemiro, Sabitzer and McTominay. Sabitzer left as he was only on loan, which was fine. McDominay, well, we all know, is very limited as a footballer. He's a good role player and can be very useful grabbing goals, but shouldn't really be starting week in, week out. And then Casemiro and Eriksen are both in their 30s and on the decline. So they need a whole new midfield. And to be fair, they did sign midfielders. Just the wrong ones. Sofian Amrabat came in and he's been a disaster. Barely playing and when he has, he's been really, really poor. He's actually been better at left back for them than midfield. Which kind of sums up his Man United career. And then Mason Mount joined who, to be fair, has been hit by injuries which is unfortunate. But even when he has played, doesn't really seem to fit the midfield balance. Luckily, Kobe Mainu has emerged and kind of saved them. But if they had signed some better midfielders in the summer, they could have had a great partner next to Mainu. Whereas right now, it's really just Mainu on his own there. And again, in the summer, they're going to have to sign more midfielders. Crystal Palace keeping Roy Hodgson in charge. Now, last season... Roy Hodgson came back out of nowhere to try and save Palace from relegation. And full credit to him, he did just that, with Palace playing some great football at points. The general idea was that he came in, saved them from relegation, but then in the summer, they would go get a new, longer-term manager. But that didn't happen, and they kept Hodgson in charge. That was a big mistake, as the wheels started to fall off under and Palace were slipping down the table and back in a relegation fight with the fans also turning the board due to the lack of 
summer window was very poor for Man City's high standards. Burnley buying too many youngsters. Many people at the start of the season had Burnley as their dark horses and dipped them for a great year in the Premier League after a sensational championship season under the young, exciting coach Vincent Company. What many of us overlooked was the age of the players they brought in. Burnley brought in about 20 million players in the summer, which I didn't actually have much of an issue with as most of their championship squad was on loans they did need to replace. The problem was, all of them were very young, inexperienced players who had never really played in England before, let alone the Premier League. Burnley had the youngest squad in the league now, and on top of that, had the youngest manager in the league with Vincent Company. A young, inexperienced manager with young, inexperienced players in the Premier League is a disaster waiting to happen, and that's exactly what's occurred. Burnley have actually played some good football at points this season, but poor decision making, game management and naivety has cost them. If they had brought in a few more senior guys in the summer, they might have had a chance of staying up. Arsenal. NA. Yeah, I don't think Arsenal have made many, if any, mistakes this season. I guess their only mistake has come in that blip they had in December, and maybe you could say not taking the domestic cup seriously, but I know that's harsh. I can't really think of any glaring mistakes they've made. Let me know, Arsenal fans, if I'm missing something in the comments below. Everton signing Beto. The biggest problem for Everton this season has been their finishing. They have underperformed their XG this season way more than any team in the league. And just by watching them, you can see they create a load of chances, but have nobody in the summer, they did bring in somebody to do just that in Beto, but it's not worked out that way. Beto has scored just three goals this season, which is nowhere near good enough. And when you consider Everton spent a lot of money on him and were banking on him being their number nine, with DCL always injured, that looks like a complete waste of money. He's not even starting games anymore, which is really poor. Calvert-Lewin is, you know, he scored like one goal this season and he still starts ahead of Beto. So if Everton had brought in a different striker, they might have been in a better position than they currently are. Fulham not cashing in on Joao Bellinho. This might seem a bit weird to suggest Fulham's biggest mistake was not selling their best player. But I think given how the season has turned out, it probably was. Bellinia in the summer was wanted by a lot of clubs, mainly by Munich, and the deal was ready, but Fulham cancelled it as they couldn't get a replacement in time. In January, teams were also interested, but Fulham wanted a high fee, so he stayed. I think this may be a mistake now, as Bellinia has been great once again for Fulham this season. But I think the demand for him has gone down with teams like Liverpool sorting out their midfield now. But I mean, it may still be interested, but with Bellini a year older, they may offer a bit less for him. Fulham have also been perfectly fine in the midfield this season with Harrison Reed and Sasa Lukic being very solid together. And Fulham are also in no real danger of being relegated. Of course, at the start of the season, they probably were feel fearful of relegation. But now, with hindsight, looking back, selling him would have been good because he would have had a lot of money there to strengthen the rest of the team. And I don't think the drop-off would be enough to relegate them. I think they would be perfectly fine. And it would have been great to rebuild that side with that money. But to be fair, it's not the end of a world keeping a fantastic player at your club. Chelsea hiring Pochettino. Chelsea have made about 5 billion mistakes since the new owners have come in, so picking just one for this season was impossible. But I'll go for one of the more important decisions, which was hiring Pochettino in the summer. Now, I have to be honest.
realised it, I actually was happy and excited when Pochettino came in, as he felt like the right choice and fit our style, our players, stuff like that. But now we can look at this with hindsight and see it was an awful decision. Look, Pochettino is not the only problem. In fact, he's nowhere near the main problem at Chelsea. But he's been a very, very poor at managing this team this season. With poor tactics, game management, he's not had any connection with the fans, poor player development and coaching. Everything has been it seems likely he won't be here next season, and even if he is, he's not going to be the long-term manager for Chelsea. I'm 100% sure of that. So that means we've wasted another season with another manager who is not going to be here for the long term, making this a poor appointment and a big mistake. signing a striker in January. There's not been too many mistakes for Wolves this season as they've had a great year, probably a lot better than most people thought, but a slight mistake they made was in January. In January, Wolves were flying, pushing for Europe and in the FA Cup quarterfinals, but they got hit by an injury to Mateus Cunha and Wang, who was in the Asian Cup, returned but then got injured. Long-term injuries, and then later Pedro Neto also got injured, meaning up top Wolves were left very short. However, they didn't address this in the January window. They decided to stick with what they had, and that's proved to be a mistake, as results have dipped recently due to a lack of forward options, as they have been relying on youngsters from the academy to try fill the void. They've also been knocked out of the FA Cup by Championship Coventry, which again was due to no striker, as they ended that game with Matt Doherty playing left wing, Ryan Nuri striker, and Leonard Chiwoma, a youth academy player, making his senior football debut on the other wing. They were knocked out, and if they had signed forward in January as a stopgap, they might well be in an FA Cup semi final and higher up in the Premier League. Sheffield United, their summer window. This season has been a complete disaster for Sheffield United and there have been tons of mistakes along the way, but I think the biggest was right at the start, the summer window. We all know about the sales they made, selling Xander Burge and Edelman and Dai in the summer, just two weeks before the start of the season. Those two sales were awful and should have been done way earlier in the window so the club had time to use that money and find replacements. In the end, they panicked and bought a load of players who quite simply were not Premier League ready. The likes of Cameron Archer, Gustavo Hamer, Luke Thomas, Tom Davis, Austin Drusty, all of these guys are decent players and I think at one stage can be Premier League players, but right now are not the level required to keep Sheffield United in the Prem. They all came in fairly late in the window as well, meaning they didn't really have much time to get used to the side. Paul Hecking Bottom couldn't really figure out his best team, and it was just awful preparations for a new season in a new league. As ultimately, been one of the main reasons relegation is looming. Spurs not signing depth in the summer. Unlike Sheffield United, there's not been too many mistakes at Spurs this season, but I guess their biggest issue has been depth. And maybe it was a mistake to go into the season with such little quality depth. Most of Spurs' signings in the summer were fantastic and have made a huge difference to the starting lineup. But the problem was they never signed any squad players. Spurs got hit with injuries, mainly at centre-back, and their only cover was Eric Dyer, who Ange didn't like, meaning they had to play full-backs at centre-back for large portions of the season. They also lost Madison, and again, didn't really have anybody who could play that Madison role up to the standards he set. In the front line at 
as well. Son went to the Asian Cup and he had injuries, so they lacked a lot of options. Now, to be fair, they did address this in January by Dragerson and Werner, but they had got these two in the summer. I think Spurs would have picked up a lot more points in the winter period and be easily in the top four. Brentford not replacing Ivan Tony. Brentford have had a very difficult season and it's been a major step back for them this year with Brentford in a relegation fight right now. Now, there is a chance of getting out and that chance is mainly because of the return of Ivan Tony, who is their star man and by far and away their best player. However, due to his gambling ban, they were without Tony until January and things went downhill very fast. They never signed a proper replacement to Tony, signing players like Mope, who's actually done okay but is nowhere near the level of Tony, and they were relying on players like Mbwemo, Risa and Sharda to fill the void. Brian Mbwemo, to be fair, stepped up but soon got injured, as did Kevin Sharda, and Johan Risa struggled on his own up there. If Brentford had just got a solid replacement for Tony in the summer, or even just another solid attacking option that could have got them by in January, they may not be in the position they currently are. West Ham, their style of play. This might sound a bit weird, how is a team style of play a mistake, but just hear me out. West Ham, results wise, have had a pretty good season. They are in the race for European spots in the Prem and have made the quarterfinals of the Europa League. But if you ask West Ham fans if they're happy with their season, I think a lot of them would say no. The reason being the style of play. David Moyes gets a lot of criticism at West Ham, sometimes rather harshly, but I think the main issue they have with Moyes is not the result, it's the style. He plays very boring, pragmatic, counter-attacking football, which has been effective and sure he can do that in a lot of games. Fans will have no issue with that. What they do have an issue is when you're at home to a Burnley, a Fulham, a Brentford, you have players like Kudos, Piquetta, Bowen, all of these great attacking talents, and you're sitting back and counter-attacking these teams. If Moyes just let the shackles off a bit in some of those games, particularly at our home, I think the fans would be off his back. And I think the general mood around West Ham would be a lot better than it currently is. Bournemouth, the FA Cup game versus Leicester. Now, I think the fact that I'm picking a single game for Bournemouth probably sums up how good a season they have had. The FA Cup game versus Leicester, Bournemouth were at this point fairly comfortable in the league, there was no real threat of relegation, and a cup run was something their fans would be hopeful of. They were drawn against Championship Leicester at home, which is tough but a winnable game, especially when Leicester rested most of their first team. But Bournemouth rotated a little bit too, which was a mistake in my opinion, and Bournemouth ended up losing 1-0 in extra time after dominating most of the game but missing loads of chances. If Bournemouth had maybe gone full strength or just had their shooting boots on, they would have been in a quarterfinal against Chelsea where, given how bad Chelsea are, they probably would have won and that would have been Bournemouth in an FA Cup semi-final which had been fantastic for them. So this game was a mistake by them but I can't really think of much else wrong with Bournemouth's season. Liverpool going a goal down all the time. Again, not a lot of mistakes for Liverpool this season, but I guess I'll go for one which has happened all season and that's being, that's being slow starters. Liverpool have been the comeback kings this season with Klopp's teams having recovered 25 points from a losing position this season, way more than any other Premier League side. That's remarkable and shows their great character and tactical adjustments, but it's also a mistake and a problem. In an ideal world, you want to be going down a goal every single game in order to click into gear, and doing this has caused them to drop points in games where they have been unable to turn it around. For example, Luton, they go a goal down, end up 
salvaging, sorry, a draw, but thanks again for you should be winning. Same thing happened, Brighton away, they went 1-0 down again, ended up drawing 2-2. Even in both Manchester City games, they went 1-0 down both times and managed to draw 1-1 in both, but particularly the Anvil game, they were the better team after they went 1-0 down and they really should have won that game. If they had just played like that the whole game instead of, you know, clicking into gear once they conceded, they would have even more points than they do. So that's just a slight mistake that we've been making this season. Luton. Game management. Yet another tough one. Liverpool, oh sorry, Luton, have done so much right this season. Defying the odds of many who predicted them to finish dead last. However, one of their problems this season has been game management. They have had so many games where they have led and then let it slip. Luton have dropped 20 points from winning positions this campaign. The complete reverse of what Liverpool have done. When Luton score first, they always seem against Man City, Liverpool twice, Newcastle, Spurs and most famously Bournemouth being 3-0 up and somehow losing the game 4-3. The game management when they are winning games needs to improve and if those mistakes have been eradicated Luton would be actually comfortably safe by now but if they go down this will be the reason why. Aston Villa, N.A. Finally, we end on an N.A., unfortunately. There's not much to say about Villa, as most of their season has been perfect. Some of their signings, such as Saniolu and Diar Diaby, haven't been great, but Saniolu is on loan, so that would be harsh, and Diaby has had some good moments, so I think I'll leave them. Other than that, I'm struggling to see, maybe not signing a backup to Watkins, but yeah, Villa fans get in the comments and tell me your biggest mistake this season, along with Arsenal fans as well. But there we go. That is every Premier League club's biggest mistake this season. Let me know if you disagree or agree with those picks. And if you have enjoyed, please leave a like, consider subscribing, and I'll see you in another video.